Hi, everybody. I'm Brendan Murphy. Matthew Brown. And this week we got a special guest. We got Fletcher Williams on the house, baby. Let's go. Hey, everybody. That's right. And this week on A Few Good Movies, we are talking about 2014's Whiplash, written and directed by Damien Chazelle. And Fletcher, this was a movie you picked um, when I came to you, like asking if you wanted to be on the show. And Thanks for being on the show, by the way. Just for really sure. Appreciate that. Thanks for being on the show. Super excited to have you here. So why did you choose this movie? Okay, so um, pretty much when you approached me and asked me to be on the show, I was thinking of movies that I could just talk about for like hours on end. And Whiplash is like the first one that comes to mind just because I it came out when I was in eighth grade and i like i saw the trailer for it and you know how like like you'll see a trailer for a movie and you don't know like anything about it besides what you saw in like the two minutes of footage that they've shown and you're just like blown away and like you know it's going to be like your movie like you just i don't know if i'm not making any sense but like (laughs) no i get what you're saying i understand that was cloverfield for me when i first saw the the uh, the, what's I'm sorry the kind of just lost my words Jesus we're all <laughs> up here um the the trailer when I first saw the trailer of Cloverfield I was like what is that I was like I need to see this immediately mm-hmm. I totally feel you on that one what you trying to say there yeah that's what kind of happened like I saw the trailer and I just it looked like a movie that was just made for me I don't know why I just mm-hmm. something like drew me to it and so I was like obsessed with it for a while and I wanted to see it so bad but where I live you know we don't get any cool like indie artsy movies like that so it just it never played like in my area Mm -hmm. so i was still dying to see it but i never had any way to check it out and then finally it came to rental and me and my brother just watched it and ever since i saw it for the very first time it's been one of my all-time favorite movies it's just inspired me and motivated me and i just every single time i watch it i'm just blown away and yeah it's just Mm -hmm. a movie that every time I come back to it I feel like I notice something different about it and Mm -hmm. it's just something that I'm able to talk about like for hours on end so I felt like it would be a good pick for the podcast for sure I definitely get that not being able to see it because like you I also grew up in one of the Carolinas and Whiplash is not a movie they're going to put in theaters in the Carolinas at all (laughs) and I remember there were a couple friends who had seen it because if you drove out like an hour hour and a half there was a small little theater playing it. And just one day, like, a buddy and his girlfriend went to go, and I was like, fuck, I want to go. But, like, they're not going to take me because, obviously, they're a boyfriend, girlfriend. I'm not getting along for, getting to go along for the movie date. That's not going to work. And I was just like, at a certain point, I was like, okay. And I used some not-so-legal means to watch this movie at home. <laughs> and even in that, like, shitty, like, not-so-legal way you can watch things, I was still just like kind of blown away by it. Like how strong that script is, how strong those performances are, like how still you can still like just how well it's composed. Like it just moves like second one. You're just like, you're hooked. It immediately like it plays like a thriller. It hooks you from second one till the very end where there's just that release. And it's, yeah, I agree with you. It's just like one of those magical movies. I feel like, especially for our generation, it's one of those movies like we all kind of watch and we're like, oh, so this is kind of how you do it. This is what you're kind of supposed to be doing. And yeah. especially since it's because it's about that like kind of artist struggle about like how much dedication you got to put in. Like what's the right way to do it? Is this, is Terrence Fletcher really like the model of some kind of teacher, some kind of mentor? Like, is he pushing too hard? Is he pushing hard enough? Like what's going on here? And that performance, man, which we'll dig into, but like, I'll never forget watching that performance for the first time, seeing the magic on screen. Mm -hmm. And especially being someone who, I know you're in the same boat, who like grew up watching J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson, like knowing him as one of the most angriest, best yellers in the business and like seeing him get this outlet to just go all in. Like it it, it was something special. It's pretty. And that's right. And, we got a squeaker in the chat, boys. Matthew Brown has not seen Whiplash. <laughs> Matthew, you watched this maybe like an hour or two ago. You finished it up. 
Yeah. What do you think of Whiplash? Uh, I got mixed reviews, to be honest. Really? Mixed. Now, the performances. J.K. Simmons, Miles Teller, incredible. Mm -hmm. J.K. Simmons, every second of it, I was either laughing or in awe of just what he was saying. Couldn't believe it. Incredible. Mm -hmm. I like the storyline. There was just a few parts that were a little weak to me. Okay. Specifically, okay. and the biggest one that really bothered me was the Nicole relationship. Okay. It was very, very weak. I felt nothing from that relationship. The couple of scenes they have together, the little popcorn scene, and then the little, the little date, and then they're just, they've been together for a long time, but then they, like, we see their first date in the breakup, and it's just, I don't know, I wasn't really, in terms of, there was nothing wrong for performance per se, but mm -hmm. I just, in terms of, like, the script, I, she, you take her out of the script, that movie's exactly the same. That, that, that's my, what did she add to it? She did, like. From that, you get that, for me personally, okay. we could talk about it more, but, like, you have that turn where Andrew is really taking it to another level. Yeah. Like I feel like from that relationship, you get a more of a, like, kind of like, how deep is he going? Like, what is he willing to go? What is he willing to cut off? What is he, what is he willing to sacrifice? Yeah. And for me that I like that relationship a lot, honestly, because I feel like, because it's that thing. Cause like the way it's set up, you're, he's kind of going through those motions, like what you're supposed to do. Like mm -hmm. when you're a college kid, like, I'm going to try to be like the top of my class. I'm going to try to have this pretty girlfriend, like all this stuff. And he's doing what you're supposed to do. But then he realizes like, cause you're not into the relationship. He is not into the relationship. There's not a single moment. I believe he's into the relationship. I think he's just going through the motions. Sure. And doing yeah. what he's supposed to do. And I think that works. Cause I feel like the only times you really see Andrew Neiman, like really, into something or really passionate about something or really talking with someone and like getting a lot out of a conversation is when he's with Fletcher. That's really the only time I feel like I see Andrew's heart actually on his sleeve a little bit. For sure. And I love seeing those scenes between like him and his dad, him and Nicole and him and like that family dinner that they like sit down. Like I love all that stuff. And I feel like him and Fletcher is like that only relationship of that movie where there's like a give and a take where at the end of the movie, they finally like come to respect and kind of like, love each other a little bit mm -hmm. i agree with you a hundred percent i like that's what i i get the like the psychology behind it everything you're saying i hear you but the relationship just from a script perspective feels weak like let's put it this way when they break up i don't i'm not sad i don't have any and maybe that's what they want you to feel maybe that's the point of it which if it is then i guess great job but for me it just I don't know, even when he called her at the end, even if she would have like said, I'm coming to the show, I still wouldn't have been gratified. I'd have been like, all right, cool. Like that's that girl that was in three scenes. And I, I don't know, but it's just, it's just me. My, from my perspective, you could have literally removed her from that movie and it would have made it better. I, I just, she didn't really, didn't sell me. I, it didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I get what you're saying. Yeah, I think, um, I think at the very beginning, there's like a, a genuine connection established between them like how it's good it's it's initial initially he i think he fletcher like calls him into his um he like invites him into his band and then he like has this newfound confidence and then he goes and asks her out and like you can see like in the the scene where he asks her out he's like so like you, there's like this joy coming out of him like he's just excited about it and so like initially there's like a real established connection between them but then slowly as time goes on and he realized the one thing he cares about is you know being the next charlie parker he doesn't like he he loses that spark that he once had so like then when he breaks up with her you just you kind of see like how this guy is just thinking about one thing and nothing else and so that's kind of the reason they have that relationship or right? why they set it up and then in the scene where they do break up i think he treats her like complete shit and you know you don't condone the things he says to her like what he's saying to her but you know you just see this guy who's consumed by his passion for drumming and so like it like i think it works for yeah. like the relationship did what it needed to do for me just to, so you could see like where his head's really at and where his heart's really at when I mean, you bring it from that perspective i mean yeah I, I get what you guys are saying i guess just for me first time seeing it not necessarily already seeing the big picture and how it's necessarily going to move the plot 
for me, it was just a relationship that didn't feel like it had any weight to it. Yeah. And so, and I guess, like I said, maybe that was the psychological point behind it is to show that it didn't mean anything to him and he was only caring about the drums. So if that's what it was supposed to do, then well done. Yeah. I mean, like, especially in that scene where he's breaking up, he's a robot. He's literally just like, okay, yeah. so here's the essay I wrote about why we should not be dating. Um, yeah. I cover all these different points. There's a little PowerPoint I have for you. So first, uh, I'm going to want to drum and I, yeah, I'm not going to want to be with you. And then I'm going to resent you. And it's, like, it's, it's literally just like him going down a list, a laundry list of like, here's why we shouldn't be together. And like, I love how unemotional he's at. Like literally everything, what he's saying makes sense to him. And I think that's why that scene is there to be like, this guy is so far gone. Like, and especially it's before the scene where he's um like rushing to get to the call time or whatever. And like is sacrificing literally like, everything to like be there and be the drummer for that set and everything like that like he's literally just like this is all he cares about literally he's gone from someone who's like trying to be like this just like regular guy who's just like really loves music he wants to be there to like like Fletcher said like his mindset is now like no I am now being pushed to be like one of the best that's what I want to be I want to be great and I cannot be great if I'm with you like that that and that works for me because, you know, honestly, like I was asking myself this question earlier today, just kind of in my mind. And I've always thought about this when I watch this movie, like, is the end triumphant or is the end kind of like, wow, he's like kind of lost his soul for this. Like everything else about him is gone. Like, obviously, whenever I watch that ending, I'm electrified. I walk out of the theater. I'm like, losing my mind like i text fletcher immediately after i was like holy fucking shit the last 10 minutes of this movie but wow. like pretty intense it's, yeah but like you think about it like he just kind of lost all human connection all he has is like his dad is like kind of looking on and he's kind of terrified of andrew like he sees andrew this is not a look of like pride or like oh my god my son is doing this he's like what am i seeing out of him like and there are those shots of him that I love where he looks like a bat out of hell drumming. Like, he does not look human. The faces he's making, the motions he's making, he looks like some kind of, like, demon going to town on those drums. And, like, I love that shit. Like, that's what, like, makes this movie so good for me. It's just, like, how far is this kid willing to go? How far is Fletcher willing to go to, like, get this music at the end of the movie? Are either one of you actually drummers? Just curious. No, I'm not. My family, uh, my dad and my both of my brothers are drummers, but I'm not a drummer. Okay. I played saxophone in high school. Okay. Nice. <laughs> um, you know, what I, was, I was just thinking one thing that I've always adored about the very like opening shot of this movie is that you learn like pretty much everything you need to know about our two main characters, Andrew and Fletcher, because you just see, it's just that like, tracking shot and then it goes into the room of Andrew playing the drums so you see this guy who's clearly obsessed with drumming and like you know his passion and then the camera turns around and you see Fletcher and he's just this like ominous dude standing in the doorway and you obviously can tell that this guy has a reputation and how he's obviously got a big name around here and that like Andrew wants to impress him so like they just like establish so much in the opening scene about our two main characters. I just think that's so cool. Definitely. They do a great job of doing that. Yeah. Which, and we talked about this a little, little bit last night when I was texting you, but like, dude, the presence J.K. Simmons has whenever he steps on screen. Like, this movie is like, whenever he's on screen, like, okay, this is pretty solid. Like, I'm liking this a lot. The performance Miles Teller is giving is pretty great. Like, this is a really good movie. This is really solid. Like, I'm feeling the tension. But like, whenever he enters a scene, the air is sucked out of the room. Like yeah, totally. the whole environment of the movie has changed. Like the energy, all of it is now something different. And that yeah. first scene does that incredibly. Mm -hmm. Like literally like stops drumming. There's just this figure now that's there. Like a ghost that's like just come out of the darkness. Just like that kind of sends chills down your spine. And just like he immediately dresses him down. Like I love the fucking, you know who I am, right? You know I'm looking for players. So why did you stop playing? And then he starts playing. He's like, why did you start playing? <laughs> Your version of an answer is to just start playing? Like, 
I love how this character operates. Just like he will find everything. He will find every nook and cranny to make you feel insecure and just like absolutely make you feel like you are nothing. You are pond scum. Like he has no respect. And he immediately is like, and I've had teachers like this. I've had people let like, or bosses or whatever that may feel like it's like this man hates me and I need his respect and I want him to love me. I don't know why, but I need it and I need it now. And I love that relationship between these two. It's yeah. so strong. <laughs> like, and I was listening to a couple interviews um, with Chazelle and with Simmons and with Teller and, you know, they just talk about the, how it's like kind of like a rela- like, um, this loving relationship between these two guys. <laughs> like, I love how you can kind of look at it this way. Cause like, I always wonder what's going on in Fletcher's head during all of this. Like, I feel like I pretty much know what's going on in Andrew's head. Cause he's kind of our audience surrogate. Like you're kind of feeling like the brunt force of what Simmons is saying all the time, but like, what is going on in Fletcher's head? Like, is he really just this maniac who think th- thinks this way all the time, which I don't feel like he is. I feel like there are those moments that we'll get to later where like you see him as he like usually is like as a person, like going about regular life. But like when it comes to music and it comes to his band, there's nothing he will not do to make sure that it is above perfect. And cause like, um, which we can go ahead and talk about it. Let's, let's, uh, Go ahead and talk about production because I want to go ahead and like kind of lead into that first scene where Andrew is like his first practice with Fletcher. Um, so now, I, um, how much do you know about like how this movie was made, Fletcher? Because I know this is one of your favorites. Do you know like know the, like the whole production history, everything like that, or anything like like I know how a, it was made? I know a bit, yeah. Um, so initially, Whiplash was a short film. Mm-hmm. that was made by Damien Chazelle because he didn't have the money to make like a feature length movie. And mm-hmm. so that actually this first scene where um, it's Andrew's first practice with the studio band and Fletcher's mm-hmm. and that, that was the entirety of the short. It's just like that one scene. Yeah. Um, and then eventually Damien Chazelle got enough money to be able to make like a feature length movie. Mm-hmm. And Actually, and in the short film, it's all, like, the original cast is there. Like, Jacob Simmons is in it. And then the guy that he yells at who's, like, out of tune, but he's not actually out of tune. Mets. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Tanner, uh, the, like, initial, like, core drummer is in the short, too. Um, yeah. yeah. I was uh, kind of doing, like, a little deep diving into just, like, the, like, early stage of the stages of this. And so the story goes that Chazelle was, like, in high school – he was a drummer who was in a very competitive jazz band and he based this movie off the experiences he had with his instructor and then just one day when he has kind of dropped all of it he just just like kind of has this idea like because he would always have like nightmares about it he's still like scared about it like he still has fond like not fond memories but memories of like what he went through during this period of his life and he was just like that's the movie i need to make like Mm -hmm. and so yes so he writes the script and jason reitman gets a hold of it and he loves it and he's like okay i want this movie to be made and no one's financing it and they eventually convince him to just like yeah we're gonna make it we're gonna take 15 pages of the script we're gonna make it into a short film that they premiered sundance and jason blum is on board at this point this one of the first couple years one of Blumhouse's first movies um yeah, exactly when I saw Blumhouse production yeah. I wasn't expecting that right before um they joined up with Universal obviously it's his first play at Oscar gold and everything like that he'll have a couple more over the next decade but yeah so this movie a short film premieres at Sundance in 2013 and it wins the jury prize for short film and then from there all the investors come in and he's able to make this movie. And then we get into some of the more incredible stuff about how they make this movie. So they shot this over 19 days, 19 days they shoot this movie and not a short movie at all. Like, and not a movie that lingers a lot on shots. Like 
a lot of quick cuts, lots mm-hmm. of setups. Like they talk about how they would do like a hundred setups a day, just trying mm-hmm. to get this done. Mm-hmm. And obviously this is a movie that is shot in a few different locations, but like they're going all over the place. There are a bunch of fish series shots. Um, this movie was shot in New York and LA, New York for a lot of the exterior stuff. Um, Santa Clarita, California, which I would drive from where I'm living right now. That feels kind of nice to have read that, but that's where they're shooting it. And it, I was just kind of amazed at like, so essentially they finally get the money and they want to premiere it at Sundance the next year. And they basically shot it, edited it within like a month or two. So they could get it under in the deadline for Sundance and then it wins the jury prize at Sundance when it finally premieres at Sundance. Like the journey this movie has is kind of incredible. Um, and we haven't talked too much about Chazelle yet, but yeah. what a great kind of like, cause he's made one movie before this, mm-hmm. which showed on a couple screen. Like I think eventually like the final tally was it showed on like six screens, something like that. And then immediately the next movie wins jury prize at Sundance gets nominated for best picture um enables him to make his like big blank check project next with la la land like he had been sitting on la la land for a while and whiplash enables him to like finally be able to make that and just you know and this is a movie about like being an artist like what it takes to be an artist like what are you going to dedicate like how hard are you going to work and like literally guys i don't know if you know the story the man was in a car accident and showed up to set the next day. Literally, the thing that happens in the movie where he's just like, is in a car accident, then immediately gets back to work. It's insane. <laughs> insane. Wait, that um, on the production of Whiplash? He yeah. was on a car accident? Wow. That's At kind least of that's <laughs> what I read on like the, uh, I think it was a Hollywood Reporter article about like the making of the movie. Uh-huh. Um, but yes, yeah, so let's go ahead and get into the scene. So up to this point in the movie, we have not seen a ton of Fletcher and what he's got under. We've seen a little bit here and there. Um, we have some great moments. Like I love when he goes into the practice for the whatever band that Neiman is at the beginning. And he just, boom, slams in. Both doors open. The whole, like I said, like the whole environment of the movie changes the whole tone changes because jk simmons is in the scene and he looks down at the sheet music and is like cute <laughs> <laughs> like immediately okay. the whole band like and he's just fucking degrading everyone in the band yeah. like oh your first chair is it only because you're cute <laughs> like he's I was just gonna say that's like my favorite line in this whole scene that's yeah. it's just so good so good um you ha- you have your introduction to what's it? It's Connolly, who's going to be like kind of his rival setup for a little bit. Which I love that little relationship too. Like it's a small one, but it's so necessary for like where the rest of the movie's going to go and how Fletcher uses or like manipulates Andrew a little bit. Uh-huh. Um, and then Andrew finally gets into the studio band, and we have what is essentially the short film yeah. pretty much i watched it again just because i wanted to kind of make sure like right before we recorded i watched the short film again because it's on the blu-ray if anyone wants to check it out um it's almost like shot for shot word for word the scene that's in the movie yeah it's pretty much identical in a lot of spots yeah a couple variations here and there but pretty much the exact same and just seeing like what that year like what chazelle learns what J.K. Simmons has been thinking about during that time. And dude, what a location can do. Like the room that's in this movie is etched into my mind forever. Like how it is the most uncomfortable room on the planet. Like I love, (laughs) I love thinking about like a scene that doesn't exist where Fletcher's just like, which room in this building am I going to pick to subject just absolute torture on like 20 kids every year? And he's like, he picks the most uncomfortable room in the building, the scariest, the darkest, the and there's no light. least well lit. No. It's never well, it's never lit well at all. <laughs> None. Edgy, the whole movie. Yeah. I fucking love that room. And you watch the short film, it's like, 
it's basically the room that um, the first band that Andrew is in, like super bright, like blue walls, and just like how well that location was picked and how well it was designed and how well it's used. Um, but then we have essentially the discussion starting like, oh, so J.K. Simmons is getting an Oscar this year. Yeah. <laughs> like, man, I cannot tell you. The first time I saw this scene, floored. I couldn't, like, I had to, like, pause for a second just to, like, readjust and be like, Jesus, <laughs> what did I just see? Yeah, he comes in hot. hot Absolutely. Does. You know what's so, like, sinister about this scene and, like, what specifically what Fletcher does is the – how he's, like – Initially, just like, all right, Andrew, just do your best. Pal. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah, buddy, yeah. buddy. Yeah, and then he, there's even, like, he starts doing the fills, and he's like, we got Buddy Rich here. Like, it's one of like, my favorite Rich. lines in the movie, we got Buddy Rich here. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, if only Andrew knew what he was in for. Because, like, my yeah. God. And you can, you can tell, like, he's, like, touching a nerve or something when as soon as Fletcher starts saying, like, a little trouble there. Not not quite my tempo. Which we'll get into boys. We'll get into all those deliveries and but like I love the scene right before where they're out in the hall talking to each other. Like yeah. that scene is fantastic because you see after watching this movie about 10, 20 times, like I have like you know in the back of Fletcher's head, he's like, I'm going to fuck this kid up. I'm going yeah. to destroy him. And how he's just getting these little pockets of information like Oh, what'd your parents do? Oh, what's he written? Yeah. What's your mom do? Oh, sorry about that. Like, and then the whole, like, he's trying to act like he's on your side. Like, it's your first day. Like, trying to get you, but like, you're meant to be here. Say it. You're meant, I am meant to be here. Like, it's completely just putting him, like, I'm comfortable. I got no problems here. Me and Fletcher, we're getting along like gangbusters. This is my best buddy in the world. I'm so excited to be playing the drums in his band. And then hell breaks loose. Yeah. Calm before the storm. Yes, sir. Well, it just gets to that point of like how mean manipulative Fletcher really is. Yeah. Like I said, like one of my favorite things to think about in this movie is that it's just what is Fletcher thinking? What's going on in his head? Like, I could fill books with just every look that he gives, and just like, is he really like? Is he really like, come on, Andrew? Like, you're better than this. Like, I know you're better than this, buddy. Like, I just got to push you a little harder. Or is he just like, I fucking hate this kid. Why is he fucking up so much? What's his problem? Is he like... <laughs> well, that's a great question. That's one of the things I was thinking when it was over. Like, you know, is he... Did he see this greatness in this kid from the beginning and that's why he's pushing him? Or is he literally just like... He just pushes everyone like this, like a maniac and somebody just finally like pushed back. Mm -hmm. to in a sense well i think back to that um and i forget the name of the kid but the scene where fletcher comes in and he's kind of just like you know he's gotten the call that um his former student has committed suicide sean casey and, yeah sean casey and his reaction is to be like i want to play some music for you guys i want to talk about how i met this kid what i saw in him mm -hmm. and i think he genuinely cares for this kid he like had a strong connection to him. He saw it and he's like, cause obviously you think about Fletcher and where he is right now. Obviously this is a guy who loves music to his core. Mm -hmm. Like he talks about um, Bird, Charlie Parker, everything like this, like with such a fondness. And obviously he's an older guy. So he was probably around for when some of this stuff was happening. Like maybe he saw Charlie Parker in con like some of these like legends of jazz in concert or he was listening to them all the time and you think about what this kid was like being inspired by and you see him now he's one of the most well respected but like he's a professor at a school he's not some world famous musician he's not out there like headlining concerts or something like that obviously he's probably a good player like there's the special guest uh terrence fletcher at the end and he's playing the piano and he's great at it mm -hmm. but He's not Charlie Parker either. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he wanted to be. Of course. Of and course. he thinks about, what if I had that person who pushed me to be this? I like to think about this shit a lot with him. I'm going to stop you right there. 
we're going to stop. Okay. That's 30 minutes. And then we'll pick back up. We'll start right back up. You were talking about, you know, what we were saying, we'll just, yeah, we'll just sure. go overlap a little bit. I just saw uh, a thing came up on my screen. It said the host upgraded the unlimited minutes. So yeah. is it like, I also saw that. Oh, did it upgrade me for free again? Maybe. So. Maybe. All right. Well, if we want to keep going, we can, and then I can just cut this out either way. Yeah. That works right, for yeah. Us. I mean, if, for some reason, it ends. It ends, and we like. I feel like you would tell me if it's gonna stop recording, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, I got the unlimited minutes thing too, so I think we're solid. So all we right, just, let's just keep going. Fuck it. Gotcha. So, what was I? Okay, I'm gonna get back to the zone a little bit. Sorry. And no, you're good. No worries. You had to do it. I understand. I mean, I literally told you like set a fucking watch, like stop us when we need to. Um. Okay. Fletcher, what was he? I don't know. Okay. Who was inspiring him growing up? And stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have this guy who like grew up loving jazz, and he sees it dying right before his very eyes. Um, me and you have talked about this a little bit. One of my favorite TV shows is The Sopranos. Um, and one of the lines that Tony has in the pilot, which I just watched recently again, is I feel like I came in at the end. I feel like my father and everyone before him, they were kind of at the ground floor of this thing. And I'm coming in at the end. And I feel like Terrence Fletcher feels that way a lot of the time. And you have to think, he's like, like you have to think of him like a doctor. Like, he's telling everybody, like, get me, like, fucking bandages, stat. I need, like, get me this, get me that. Like, he's trying to single-handedly save jazz by his, like, crazy methods. For sure. And... And he's like given himself this mission to do it. Mm -hmm. And I fucking love that scene towards the end where he, um, him and Andrew have that conversation in the jazz club where you really do get like the dimension of this character and this oh, yeah. performance. Um, and you also have to think about like, what is Damien Chazelle seeing in 2013, which is five years after Iron Man, five years after the Dark Knight, Studio filmmaking, studio blockbusters have taken over. The smaller film is dying. You have to think that some of that frustration with Damien Chazelle, who you look at his career, what's he made? He's made a thriller, he's made a musical, and he's made his like big space epic, which are movies that historically over the last 10 years don't make a lot of money, aren't very popular. Yeah. He sees this smaller kind of movie like dying right in front of him. And I feel like he has to put a lot of that into Fletcher. I feel like there's a lot of Damien Chazelle in both characters, obviously. Um, like I said, he was a drummer. He based this off of his experience and everything, but I'm sure he channels a lot of like what he's feeling into that character about like the film industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like we talked about this, like you said he was one of your favorite villains ever, like when we were talking about last night. And I don't necessarily see him as a villain. Mm -hmm. Is he kind of the antagonist is he a big obstacle yeah to say he antagonizes andrew neiman is a bit of an understatement i would say <laughs> um but i feel like there's this like like i don't know there are those little scenes and there's especially just the fact that i love jk simmons one of my favorite like smaller character actors like i love seeing him whenever he pops up in a movie mm -hmm. um one of the lost episodes i love you man one of my favorite jk simmons performances um, him and Robbie going back and forth. I always love that shit. Literally, one of my best friends. No, not my like me and my the picture of my dad and my phone is like the fist bump between Robbie and J.K. Simmons in I Love You Man because I fucking love those two together so much. Incredible. So and, great. right. And you gotta think that a guy like this who has acted for a long time, he started off on the stage, who has played a lot of interesting characters over the years is thinking about all this kind of stuff. And, you know, if you see something that you love that is like dying on the street, what are you going to do to save it? And you get it. You get it. Once that moment happens in the movie, you kind of understand where Fletcher is coming from, which is hard to do. He does a lot of awful shit in this movie. Mm -hmm. He's a manipulative downright son of a bitch. Who's going to like absolutely destroy you verbally and mentally. <laughs> And it, you know, does it work? Yeah. It's the question you got to ask at the end of the movie. Like, the does line, it work? The line where he says, um, well, of course he like explains his motivation. Like I push people beyond what's accepted of them. I think that's an absolute necessity. 
And then Andrew, I love how Andrew kind of says the question that you're kind of thinking as the audience. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, do you ever cross a line? Like, is there a point where you've gone too far? And his response is so brilliant when he says, um, well, first he does the, like, if you go too far, wouldn't, would maybe the next Charlie Parker get discouraged? Yeah. And he's like, no, man, no. Cause the next Charlie Parker wouldn't be discouraged. It's like such a brilliant line and so everything, good. all the abusive, awful stuff that he does to these students. Of course you don't condone any of it, No, but you understand where he's coming from. And he explains like, Every Starbucks jazz album that you can find right now proves my point that there's no two words more harmful in the English language than good job. I mean, this, yeah, like kind of like what you're saying, this guy sees jazz as this dying art form and he's pushing his students beyond what anyone else would expect of them because he wants to save jazz. And it's just like the one scene, like it just does such a good job at, recontextualizing everything he's done up until that moment. And like, I think like my favorite villains in movies mm -hmm. are ones that, you know, you don't know what they're doing, but you totally understand where they're coming from and their motivations make sense. And Fletcher is that for me, like, and this one scene just like takes it for me. 100%, 100%, couldn't agree more. And he does do a lot of awful shit, which we need to, we do need to hammer home. like. And here's the other thing about him, yeah. too. Yes, he does some awful stuff. He is so damn entertaining to watch. I'm laughing my ass oh. off during this movie. Like, yes, it's horrible. It's painful. It would ruin any person. Like, I don't know what I would do if I was in that situation. I'd probably, like, fucking just fall on the floor and have a heart attack or some shit like that. But, like, I cannot help but, like, laugh hysterically at all the shit he says. There's so many good lines he has in this movie um specifically we can talk because we didn't talk about it too much but that first scene when you really get to see fletcher with oh there's a player who's out of tune <laughs> just, oh yeah and just like oh maybe there's a bug that flew in my ear like all these little things and you got to give a bunch of the credit to first script but also jk simmons knows how to deliver the shit out of this oh yeah and i feel like one of the reasons you pick him is, once again, he's played one of the best yellers in cinema, J. Jonah Jameson. Mm -hmm. um, everyone who's ever loved Spider-Man needs um, J.K. Simmons to play J. Jonah Jameson again. I fucking screamed at the end of uh, Far From Home when he showed up again. <laughs> like, just give me more and more of that shit, I'm all in. He's the yeah. best. He made me want to consider getting into newspaper because I wanted him to be my boss. I was like, really? I can do this. I could accept <laughs> these rules and live by them. Yeah. <laughs> what is it in Spider-Man 2? Horseshit. Horseshit. Or it's like crap. Crap. Yeah, he just hates all Double crap. Thing. Yeah, double Major crap. crap. He's like, give me a hundred bucks, Robin. <laughs> it's incredible. I'll give I you a nice talking. piece of Christmas meat. Yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> Dorothy gets on the line. He's like, hey, tell him to send a piece of meat. <laughs> I've always thought of Fletcher in Whiplash. He's kind of like if J. Jonah Jameson shaved his head and just became 100%. 50 times meaner and just nastier than he was in the yeah. Raimi trilogy. I mean, the reason J.K. Simmons signs on to this movie is because. Like I said before, Jason Reitman was one of the first people who read the script and was like, okay, I believe in you. Like, we need to make this. We need to get it happening somehow. And J.K. Simmons is one of those people that always works with Jason, Reit with Jason Reitman. I think he's been in six out of his seven movies. So he knows J.K. Simmons is like, oh, you need someone who's going to be, like, super angry and yells at people. Well, I know J.K. Simmons, so, like, you want him? And he's perfect. He fits yeah. like a glove. Like... It's one of the most perfect, like, meldings of, like, character, persona, like, actor persona. I can't imagine anyone else being in this role. I don't know who else could have done it. Without his delivery, the movie does just doesn't work. Like, he's just, he makes it what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you guys think he, I mean, it's almost a, uh, it's almost a, like, a pointless question, but I'm just curious. Do you think those things he was saying, do you think that was improv or do you think that was actually wrote into the script? Written. You think so? Yeah, I think most of it was written. Yeah. yeah. 
I was uh, I was thinking some of those like just when he goes off on these little like cussing tantrums kind of. I felt, I got the vibe that he was like that was improv. I mean, I could be completely wrong. I haven't seen see, the script, but if you watch the short film, it becomes pretty evident that most of the stuff is, comes from Chazelle. Okay, see that right now. Yeah, and I, like I said, I was been listening to interviews and reading stuff about what the actors and the director said. Mm -hmm. J.K. Simmons says like 95% of the script is Chazelle and 5% is uh, Simmons and Teller. Okay, see, there you go. Yeah. Um, I mean, if someone could come up with the shit on the spot, bravo, you have... Well, <laughs> see, that's why I was asking because have you ever seen, we, you, you want to go, we were talking about Kubrick right before we got on here. Have you ever seen Full Metal Jacket? uh not the full thing i've seen the first hour though which is what i'm sure you're alluding to okay well the guy who's the drill sergeant i can't think arlie of name, arlie ermy he he well you know so when they brought him onto that movie there was somebody else originally that was supposed to play that part mm -hmm. so while this guy was training him though he just started going off on all these little tangent one-liner things that you know he would just make up kubrick loved it so much he was like dude i need to use this guy and then the actual bits that are used in the movie 95% of that is improv. It's just him being his old drill sergeant ways doing that. That was where the question even came from. So I was like, kind of the same vibe. I was wondering maybe did he, that's interesting that one so script driven and the other one is literally like almost 100% improv. Mm -hmm. It's really cool I mean, to see both aspects of that. for sure. And I mean, you gotta think that for this movie and for Fletcher, um, Full Metal Jacket's gotta be one of the biggest inspirations for it. You think so because I mean you could the similarities are there. I got I felt it immediately. I was like, okay, I'm back in boot camp. Here we go. Yeah, it's a guy just yelling at people and causing like devastating trauma for the rest of their lives. Like that's Full Metal Jacket. Like that's it. That's right there. Even down to the guy killing himself. The yeah. guy literally blows his brains out in the bathroom. Yeah. So I, uh, not a Sergeant Pyle. Uh, is it uh, Sergeant Pyle? Or is that? Uh, no, Sergeant Pyle, I thought, was the one with the glasses, like the one that... Isn't that Joker? Or... I haven't seen the Joker. whole movie. That is Joker. You're right. It is Sergeant Pyle. It is Sergeant Pyle. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Um, Hi, Joker. Yeah, it's Sergeant <laughs> Pyle, for sure. Dude, got to give a good old shout-out to Vincent D'Onofrio, another incredible bald actor. Bald <laughs> actors are the best. You gotta give him all your love. Well, he was bald in that one. He uh, ended up doing because he wasn't bald when he was doing. Uh, didn't he do a whole bunch of like Law and Order or whatever? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I'm just like yeah, making jokes. Like, I don't remember that because yeah. my mom was obsessed with him when she watched Law and Order growing up. Like when I was growing up. I mean, he did go on to play Kingpin. I gotta get that's another great bald performance from okay. Vincent D'Onofrio. Uh, gotta give it up. Gotta give it up. Uh, so yeah, I mean. You're right. We're talking about like some of these lines he has, like, especially one of my favorite sections of the movie is when they're trying to figure out who is going to be able to play Caravan. And it's just those three guys switching out. And he has specific, like, ready to go insults for all three of them based on <laughs> their sexual orientation, mm -hmm. their heritage, their family, like, back, like, everything. Incredible. Just immediately back to their core. And man, one of my favorite, like, laugh out loud moments from this movie. Oh, it was the chair. The chair was what yeah. was keeping me back. Uh -huh. It's going to be perfect now. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it yeah. better be. Got to adjust the seat. So funny. You Patty McFucking Cracker, whatever he and, says. Uh, yeah, the word choice is phenomenal. I've laughed so many times this year. Yeah. And I was like, Jesus, that sounds like. Uh, it sounds like my dad, to be honest. It was like... <laughs> I'm going to start calling you Flannery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could make a compilation of all of Fletcher's insults, and it would contain, like, half of some of the best insults in film. It's yeah. just so good. Yeah. It's like getting back to that Full Metal Jacket thing. Like, every single one of these is just, like, gold. There's not a single one that doesn't land. Yeah. Every single one. Like, I – if you – told me the line like i'd be able to nail the delivery just because i know jk simmons and how he's gonna deliver it. like why are you looking down there there's no fucking mars bar down there yeah. <laughs> you know you know what one of my oh. favorite scenes in the entire movie is is when they're they're at like the it's like the first concert that they're prepping for mm -hmm. and they're like backstage and he's talking about the folder and he's mm -hmm. like if i see one more of these things lying around I swear to God, I will stop being so polite. Get the fuck out of my sight before yeah. I demolish you. 
Just brilliant. I can still see you, Mini Me. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. So I good. fucking love that shit because I don't know. I was a band kid. Were you guys band kids at all? High school, middle school, anything like that? Band. I, I played kid. band uh, yeah. middle school, and then like the first year of high school, I think, and then I didn't play. Gotcha. I was in there seven years. Dude, they are so lucky. This movie came out the year after I graduated. <laughs> Up and down, I would have quoted this movie all day long. Yeah. And I was in marching band and all that shit, like, which is basically everyone for like two weeks out of the summer is together all the time, every single day, two weeks. I would have hammered this movie into every person I knew. I was like a section leader for uh, the saxophones and everything like that. Every practice, I would have quoted this movie every single time. You think I would have brought out, not quite my tempo, every single day? I'm sure that's happened in several band studios. Every annoying band kid has seen this movie and quotes it up and down. And I, while I'm sad I missed my chance, I'm glad I'm not one of those people. But I would have done that shit in a heartbeat. In high school, absolutely. There's no question I don't bring it out every single time. Missed your moment, Brendan. Missed your moment. Every time I'm holding like the little thing, you gauge to see if everyone's too. Oh, we have an out of tune player. I have <laughs> yeah. Unless my ears are uh, wrong. And when I finally figured out, now either you know and you were intentionally trying to destroy my band, or you don't know, which is just as bad. Which every time I hear you're, you're trying to sabotage my band, I fucking lose it. That's <laughs> yeah. perfect. I love that shit. You're trying to sabotage my band. No, mm. man. Everyone's out to get him. I fucking love that ment- Not the mentality, but just to have, like, that thought process. He think literally, he's waging a war. Yeah. <laughs> you are trying to sabotage me and my goals, and yeah. I will not let you. Well, a, mean- lot of, a lot of what, like, makes it so interesting is the, the psychological battle between <laughs> Andrew and Fletcher. And so, like, that's Fletcher's end game is like everything revolves around his band. So he's just going to like, that's immediately what he goes to no matter what. Mm-hmm. Which we didn't talk about a lot, but we, we got to talk about Mets a little bit. Cause I feel like that's one of the moments you really get Fletcher's mind games. Like you've seen it a little bit, but like really when he's just like, for the record, Mets wasn't out of tune. It was you, but he didn't know. And that's even worse. <laughs> like, you really get the sense of this man is playing the long con at every second. He's playing mind games. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. at any moment, if that guy is just confidently saying, no, I'm not out of tune, he's out of the doghouse. He's good. He's right. It's that but, confidence he's looking for, that like knowing that you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not being unsure of yourself and just like hoping I don't get, you know, I, 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 I got to appreciate it. Oh, 100%. I, and I feel like that's another reason why he bonds with Andrew. Not initially, but, like, why he keeps pushing him. Like, this kid is going to fight me on shit. Like, he's not going to sit idly by. Every time Andrew gets something taken away from him, he fights it. He's, like, in Fletcher's face as much as Fletcher is in his face. One of the best scenes in the movie is when he – is at one of the other competitions and Fletcher's about to give it to Connolly and Andrew finally lose it, loses it and fucking goes off on Fletcher. Yeah. Dare yeah that's a great scene. Cause he like, this is the first time you really see him like challenge him to his face. Mm-hmm. I was just watching their back and forth. It's so great. Mm-hmm. 100%. Uh, I'm not sure. I feel like we've still got to like dig a little bit into that first scene a little bit. Cause I feel like that's where you really, that's some of Miles Teller's best performance in the movie is that first practice. Yeah. Um, and there's just so much good, like dude, when he throws that chair, every time it hits, every time I watch this movie, I'm waiting for it. I'm seeing him just like, Oh, okay. All right. We're feeling <laughs> Okay. And I see him put his hand on that chair, and I'm like, here we go. I'm ready. Let's do it. It's because when we talked about it last night, I mentioned that Fletcher feels like 
he's Darth Vader walking onto the bridge of a Star Destroyer. Like that presence is just, when's he going to fucking unload on people? When's he going to like bring out the force choke? All that shit. When he finally throws that fucking chair, it's like, it's on. There's a fucking lightsaber fight going on. Like the stakes have now been risen to their like fullest extent and we're in. Yeah. You know what? I, um, what, this might be kind of a weird comparison, but Mm -hmm. I don't know if like, so you know, when you watch infinity war, Mm-hmm. And Thanos is just the kind of villain where, like, whenever he's on screen, mm-hmm. it feels like nobody's safe. Like, mm-hmm. anything could happen. And, like, you don't know who's going to die, who's going to live, or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. every time he's on screen, you just, like, get that feeling. That's kind of the same thing with Fletcher. Like, you just, mm-hmm. nobody's safe from what he's about to do. And he's so unpredictable, you just don't know what's going to happen. So, mm-hmm. like, he has that, like, Thanos dynamic. I don't know. I don't know if that was well, a weird comparison. I can see that. Fun. Yeah, I can kind of see that. He has that. Pre- I mean, we talked about it a little earlier, but he has just this presence. Whenever he walks into a room, yeah, everything stops. The world ar- stops spinning for just a couple seconds while um, J.K. Simmons is just laying down the law. I mean, even when he's out in the hall talking to that little girl, I'm like, is he going to snap? Is he going to just throw this little girl across the hallway? <laughs> what is she going to say that's going to set him off? Yeah. I'm like, he like raises his hand for a high five. I'm like, He's going to slap that little girl. He's going to do it right now. Oh, it's just a high five. Okay. All right. Okay. We're okay. And you hear that line. When you grow up, do you want, are you going to play for me in my band? And I'm like, no, don't do it. Don't sell your soul to this man, little girl. Get out while you can. And I also got to think a little bit about, so there's that guy that is, was a student of Fletcher's and like came back and was like, I want to see my old band teacher why what? <laughs> yeah. what drove him like i have to i imagine how um i don't know like you think about whenever someone goes through a super tough project or there's always like the, the guy who's over everything who's like fucking yelling at everybody like you gotta imagine at the rat party after everything's done like he finally unloads. Is like Jesus Christ. I'm so sorry, guys. But we did it. We won. We've, like I got all of you jobs. You're all gonna be playing Lick and Center for the rest of your lives. Like I did that shit. You gotta love me for doing that for all of you. Because I feel like that's why Andrew's in this class. Why he wants to be in there so bad. Being in this class, being successful in that band, is like a ticket to do whatever you want. Essentially, in that world. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I just find that interesting. Like, cause I've had that thing where maybe I go back once to see my old high school band just one more time before I go off to college. Like I was home one weekend and there was a f- football game that my brother was going to. And I was like, Oh, I'll go see everybody. Like, I'll go see how the old band's doing. But to still be like, this man has a child and he's still like, honey, today we're going to go see my old band teacher. <laughs> and it's Terrence Fletcher, the most horrifying man on the planet. He maybe scared me to like, Maybe his methods changed a lot over the years. Right. <laughs> he, might, he might have been calm in his early days. Yeah, it's true. It's possible. I can't um, imagine that, though. Like, because what? That puts it maybe in the J. Jonah Jameson years as far as, like, where he, uh, J.K. Simmons is in age. He's mm-hmm. still got it. Like, he'll still <laughs> yell the shit out of you. Like, I don't know. But I think that's just a funny little detail. Yeah. Um, and yeah maybe we haven't, uh, we haven't talked too much about um, – We've talked a lot about Fletcher, obviously, and I feel like we have to. This movie yeah. is still built around that. Um, maybe we should talk about a little bit just Andrew. We yeah, haven't... I was – there was something I wanted to bring up earlier when you were mm-hmm. talking about, like, uh, being in school and stuff and, like, band and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so when this – well, first of all, I'll say um, easily the best performance I've ever seen from Miles Teller. He's – 100%. He's just so, like – he just really conveys, like, that passion – and, like, how, like, obsessed he is with drumming and how, like, that's the one thing he cares about. And, like, nothing is going to deter him from, you know, becoming one of the greats, like he kind of says to um, Nicole when they're having their whole moment. But, um, so, one scene that I love that I feel like a lot of people don't really talk about that much is the dinner scene with the family and, like, when the cousins come over. And, like... Maybe the best scene of the movie. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And Pretty great. Let's see the movie. So, and, like, one of the things, for me at least, personally, it's, like, this was, like, one of the first movies 
where I felt like I kind of saw myself on screen and I really related to Andrew's character personally because like this movie came out, I was in eighth grade, I was in middle school. Middle school, you know, it's some, some awkward years just in mm-hmm. general for everyone. But like for me particularly, I was like, I was always like really into arts and movies and music and stuff like that. And so I wasn't like, there was like a social hierarchy in middle school where like the kids who were on the top were all like athletics and like obsessed with that kind of stuff and like on the football team and on the basketball team and all that kind of thing. And I just wasn't in that whole in crowd. I was, I was more like an artsy person. And so it didn't mesh well with like the, the popular kids back in the day. And so when Andrew is at the dinner table and, you know, his family comes in and they're, they won't shut up about his cousins who are on the football team. And they like, they're like, Hey, Tom Brady. And like talking about how great it is that they're like on model like, UN baby. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff. And then like, they're like, Oh, Andrew. So you, uh, how's the uh, music going? Like they, they clearly just don't give a shit about like whatever. He's and doing. there's Andrew with the, with the drumming. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, like yeah, yeah, dude, you know, it's so disrespectful. Yeah. Just seeing how like underappreciated he is for something he cares so much about and how like the dad at one point is just like, well, I'm glad you've uh, figured it out <laughs> or like whatever like that. Like they you just- have any friends, just... Andrew? Yeah. What I love, weird. what I love is how he just, you know, for me, I, you know, again, like you said, seeing yourself on the screen, I feel like I can relate to that moment of like, you know, everyone else gets rewarded for doing, I don't know what like is expected or whatever, but I'm trying to do something a little different and mm-hmm. you know, it gets, you know, well, why isn't it, is it doing this? Is it getting you a job? Is it blah, blah, blah. Uh, when he finally just snaps and goes off and has like this subtle, he's like, it's division three. <laughs> it's not even division two. It's division three. Says, Why don't yeah. you come play with us? He said four words. You're never going to hear from an NFL team. I do. I, I got up. Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> brother. I, was, I was out the door with him. I was like, you damn right. I got so worked up. It's great. See, gratifying. I wish I could say that to a few people. I wish I would have done that moment and just went ahead and took it. Mm-hmm. Good one. I mean, it's one of those scenes where you first start to see Fletcher really rubbing off on Andrew. Because yeah. the Andrew at the beginning of this movie does not do that. No way in hell he ever shy does that. Shy and timid. I mean, not even that, like, you think about, honestly, I've never thought about the scene in this way. It finally clicked. Because I'm always like, why is this scene in the movie? But when they go to the movies and uh, he pours the raisinets in the popcorn, and his dad is like, why don't you grab one of the raisins? And he's like, I just, I don't want any of the raisinets. I'll just eat around them. And that's just like, I don't understand you. And it's like, that's him. He's just like, I'm not going to make a big stink. If he wants the raisins, he can have the raisins. That's like, that's fine. Like, not one of those guys who's going to make a big fuss about anything. But yeah, when he finally like has a moment, it's division three always. It's one of those lines that like really, it gets you. Yeah. It's one of those ones that like the whole tone changes. No. Uh-huh. So good. Division three. Like what? <laughs> division three. See, it's not even division two. It's division three. Yeah. It's pretty. And they're talking about like he threw like an 80 yard touchdown pass and he's like, it was division three. What else is he <laughs> yeah. gonna do? That's what division three play like. Mm-hmm. Um and man, I fucking love the it's such perfect, like middle class suburban, not suburban, because they live more in New York. It might be more upstate. Uh-huh. But Oh, Tom Brady, because he plays football. That's great. Yeah, exactly. I love that shit. It's so good. It's so well dialed in. And, man, it's – I love how everyone at that table is just, like, sticking the knife in a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. I mean, like I said, one of my favorite lines of that scene is, oh, and Andrew with, with the drumming. With whenever, the drumming. Whenever anybody says, and you with the, with the thing you're doing, it's like – Oh, I have zero respect for you and what you're doing. I don't I have no faith. I don't believe in you. I don't give a shit at all. And then there's that whole conversation about what is success that they have, which is really great. The fact that everyone at the table is talking about Charlie Parker um, after he died, what, his like late 30s, drunk, his uh, arms full of heroin. But renowned as one of the greatest musicians of the 20th century yeah and you know i think it's the first time his father has seen that too 
which has to worry him a little bit, which we haven't talked about it at all. Very small, quiet, dialed-in performance from Paul Reiser, who I'm a big yeah. fan of. Yeah, I like how he shows up in this movie. Yeah. I mean, every time I'm just like, oh, it's that dude from Aliens. I love him. He's great. <laughs> love um, that guy. Um, I think he, like, that's another one of those performances that kind of goes along with um, Melissa Benoist as, what's his name? I forget the name of the character. But Nicole, Nicole yeah, where those are the relationships in the movie that really show how far gone Andrew is at a certain point. Um, and I don't know, like, like we were talking about earlier when you find, when he finally sees Andrew playing caravan at the end with that solo, where he's just like, this is not my son. This is some kid. I don't like, I don't know him. I don't know this insane person that I'm seeing before me. And I love seeing that transformation in their, that relationship. And just quick little tangent side story, because I think it's funny as hell. Every time he says, and I, uh, I stock the, the pantry with gushers. I'm like, I need to go buy 20 boxes of fruit gushers right now. Literally <laughs> every single time. And I remember back in college, um, around the time this movie came out, me and a buddy, um, he just had transferred to the school I was going to. So we were hanging out a lot and it was around the time when flash came out and literally for like months, that man's pantry was stocked with gushers only <laughs> because of this line only really? because the fruit gushers line, man. That's funny. Oh my God. Underrated line in the movie. Uh, I stocked the pantry with fruit gushers. Shout out to <laughs> fruit gushers. Uh, we are looking for sponsors for the show. Uh, we will <laughs> Shout sing- out fruit gushers. Fruit gushers, baby. Um, we will sing high from the mountaintops, the praises of the delicious gummy. <laughs> that is. I'm getting a fruit gushers t-shirt. Fruit gushers, baby. <laughs> I hope next week that's all we're wearing. We got the hats. We got the shirts. Yeah, no, we're going through. full fruit gushers next week. Everybody bring a pack. I'm all in. Next week, dude, a few good movies, more like uh, a few good fruit gushers. That's all That's all we're doing. Four so, out of ten on that joke. Four, four out of ten? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what. I was four trying to come out of ten up. on that one, dude. Good uh, stuff. Honestly, I think the four is generous. I think that's a tip. That's four a tip. is me being your friend. Yeah. No, that was bad. I just needed to throw it in there just as like a little button. We had to do it. I'm not proud of it. Uh, but it's, hey. it's what had to be done. Hey, everyone's still breathing. Check the pulse. We're yeah. gonna be all right. Everyone... So, so whiplash. Um, <laughs> whiplash. Absolutely. Dude, I swear you should have been on for the Home Alone episode. 10, 10 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. Want to learn about cheese pizza? You go cheese ahead pizza. Uh, ten, another ten on craft macaroni and cheese. It was great. <laughs> Necessities. People don't understand. The devil's in the details. The devil, devil is, is in the details. details. Yeah. See, I'm a little concerned they didn't show the fruit gushers. That's the one thing. Like, we were talking about how we were so in love with the pizza and the mac and cheese from Home Alone. If I saw the Fruit Gushers in this movie, I'm sure I'd still be buying Fruit Gushers in droves to this day. And once again, I welcome all sponsors. Fruit Gushers, we will shill for you in a second. We're going to tag you in this post. Tagging them. (laughs) Absolutely, we're going to tag Fruit Gushers in this post. I I, would have liked to have seen the Fruit Gushers. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. We get some popcorn. We get some raisinets. I want to see the Fruit Gushers. That's just me. It's a small, uh, small price to ask. That's right. I mean, I'm sure Fruit Gushers would have shelled out a little bit to be in Whiplash. I mean, I'm sure the name drop alone, like, sales went up, like, 300%. I got to imagine. Because uh-huh. I don't see too many people buying the Fruit Gushers these days. But it's uh, lost art. It's not really. It's not. It's not the. So, oh, okay. 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 Just if we're going to go on tangents for a second. Uh-huh. So Fruit Gusher is cool and all. But there's something called a Nemtu. It's my, my girlfriend. She's from Germany. It's a German candy. It's basically like a Starburst, but then like a fruit gusher on the inside. It's Excuse the greatest me? piece of candy you'll ever have in your entire life. It's called a Nemtu. When I get more, Brendan, I got exclusive access to it. I'll change uh, life. I'll how change many life with a Nemtu? How much are tickets to Germany? Sure. Uh, they're like two grand. Worth Don't it. worry. I, hey, I got a plug over there. They can just, I can get a mail. Don't you worry. Okay. I got, Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. It'll be down for like five boxes, Dude, five crates. Last year I got some. I had like seven or eight bags of it. That's enough about the Nimtus. We'll get on. That's another day. That's okay. another day. But back to Whiplash. Yeah. Um, so one thing we haven't really talked about with this movie yet, which is kind of crazy, we haven't. We have not talked about the music at all. Oh, yeah. Which, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, Across the board. One of my favorite soundtracks of all time. I actually sure. own it on vinyl downstairs. 
Absolutely. I mean, you have to. It's now obviously there are the pieces that they play in the movie. There's Caravan. There's Whiplash. Um, I wish I remembered what the song they, that um, Fletcher uses to try and fuck over Andrew at the end. I think it's like Swingin' or Up something. Swingin'. Up, Up Swingin'. swingin'. That's yeah. it. Uh-huh. Um, but there's also just like a really nice score under it too. Um, yeah. And obviously, Damien Chazelle, very gifted with the music, as we could say, uh, makes La La Land. Pretty great movie. Someday we'll probably do it because it's pretty great. I'm no, a big I fan. I haven't seen La La Land. Don't kill me. But I haven't. Seen oh boy! Oh, really? Yeah. No, I, 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 I've held on to that as a secret. I don't want to tell anyone. But I haven't See, seen La La Land. I mean, this is the perfect place to do it online. I mean, with your fa- like full on can be quoted and everything. Like, let's do it. I'm ready. I mean, that surprised me a little bit because it's like the most LA movie to come out in the last ten years. I feel like. I'm saying it out loud for an accountability thing. So now we got to watch right. it. At some point. See, now I'm going to make you watch La La Land, which is um, going to be fun for me. I'm ready to do it. I like that movie a lot. I mean, it was one of those movies where me and the two people I was living with uh, when we moved out here, um, literally they were like, we have to watch La La Land on like the first couple of nights. And I was like, that, that, I have no problem with that. I'll do that in a heartbeat. Don't you worry. I'm ready to do that movie anytime. Uh, I'm here for some Ryan Gosling action at any point, so. <laughs> Not, so good in that movie. I, I, I won't be upset. I was watching. I don't even want to go on the Gosling tangent, so I'm not going to. But I saw there was a little piece of the Notebook. It was on. It was playing. I got all worked up. He was hanging from the the merry-go-round. Or no, the the Ferris wheel. Mm-hmm. Anyways, this has nothing to do with Whiplash. I'm sorry, but Ryan Gosling, <laughs> I'm here for it any day of the week. One thing I will say is that I wish Whiplash got like half the attention that La La Land does, because like most people, I feel like they know Damien Chazelle for La La Land, but Mm-hmm. me personally at least i think whiplash is the far better movie like on his sure. part see that's what's crazy now it's been a short career mm-hmm. like we'll have to say that up front la la land is maybe my least favorite out of those three like because i'm big on first man i love first man a lot i enjoyed it i thought it was more of like a technical masterpiece than it was like a you know story fair but first man, I, that's the the space movie that also with Ryan Gosling, right? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, that movie was uh, that movie was hard for me to get through. It was really slow. It was a really. Yeah. Slow. I mean, I understand, you know, that's not supposed to be a fast paced mm-hmm. film. It's just talking about like the first, but it was really, really slow. It was kind of it, it kind of drug a little bit. See, that's what I kind of found interesting about it because you talk about Law and especially you talk about Whiplash, both very like fast paced, for lack of a better word, like. La La Land, not as much, but, like, super fast-paced. And I liked seeing that side of Chazelle where he just kind of, like, slowed down a little bit, let Gosling, like, perform. And also, he gets a lot bigger budget because La La Land made so much money and got nominated for all these Oscars. And almost won Best Picture, which was fun. That was – that's – I'm never going to forget that moment on television. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, But, like, seeing him – do these like giant massive big budget um set pieces like making a space movie i like that movie a lot and it's i haven't watched it in a long time but it's also like one of the moments where i really saw something different from gosling who one of my one of the better actors of this generation i think we can all agree on that a lot of range sure and i don't know it's it's an interesting movie to me i haven't watched it in a long time but I like that movie a lot. It's just, I think for me, and I think this happens um, over the years, but like La La Land has sort of lost its magic a little bit for me. Like I've watched it a couple times. I still enjoy it. But like the last time I watched it, I'm just kind of like, this doesn't have the same feel it had for me when I first saw it in the theater, which happens with a lot of movies. But like, I feel like it's a much bigger drop off than like what usually happens with those kinds of movies. But that's just me. Um, but yeah, back to, back to Whiplash. Yeah. About that. But yeah, so basically, yeah. So the music in Whiplash, very good. I mean, like I was talking about earlier, the last 10 minutes of this movie are phenomenal, edge of your seat, gripping, electric filmmaking. And dude, every time I put Caravan on, whenever I'm driving my car, I'm hooked. I like get immediately that feeling again, like in the pit of my stomach, my heart is racing because I'm seeing the movie and I'm seeing the frames in my mind and everything. I like I can't associate that piece of music with anything else other than those last ten minutes of this movie, mm-hmm. um, which 
I know he picked a lot of the music off of this, um, what they're playing and everything, based off of what he played when he was a drummer in middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. Um, But to take those pieces of music and change, especially Caravan, like, like I've already said, Caravan, incredible. But however they came up with that drum solo at the end, man, I don't know. Yeah, that's crazy. I don't know. Dude, it reminded me of like, so I was blessed to go see uh, Rush 2112 concert. They played the whole album front to back. Mm-hmm. And Neil Peart did like a 20 minute drum solo. It was the fakest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And that's what I was feeling when this was happening. I was like, what? I was like why is he still drumming? What is going on here, dude? This is out of control. Yeah. Howard's hands still attached to his body. Yeah, I don't know. And I, I, I'm going to assume yes, but I hate to assume. So I'm going to ask you guys because I know for sure Brendan's going to know the answer. Because I'm actually, did he actually learn to drum for this movie? Yes. Or he actually learned and went through all the training to drum like that. That wasn't it's, it's, like. It's not all him. It's like. Not all him. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking some of the shots they don't show his face, and like the hands are going crazy fast. I'm like, there's no way he trained. That looks like the best, quickest drummer ever. Yeah. The vast majority of Caravan, I know, is like a double. Yeah, it has um, to be. Some like okay. crazy. Yeah, I was going to say, because if he learned that, Brody is actually one of the, like, he, he's got a whole other skill set to get him a whole new lifestyle. He could go, yeah. it's crazy. It was out of Yeah. Miles Teller certainly did do like, like some of the drum. I think he said like in an interview that he did like 40% of the actual drumming like in the movie. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, he, some of it he's definitely doing like on set. Okay. Um, but okay. So one thing I did want to bring up, like with the music is that it's just like, so one, one of my favorite things about whiplash is just how there's this constant energy, like through the entirety Mm -hmm. of the movie. And like the music is just so fast paced and like it, Mm -hmm. um, particularly when you get to the, right after the opening scene, it's overture is the song that plays. And like, there's just all these quick cuts of like the, the city and like Mm -hmm. it just establishes like where it takes place and all that stuff. And it's just like, there's just so much energy and it's because the music is just so fast. And um, that leads me to, on a technical standpoint, this movie is just flawless, like all the way through. You got, um, I mean, the music's great, but Mm -hmm. some of the best editing I have ever seen in a movie. Tom Cross, the guy who edited this, knows what he's doing. Yeah, Um, I I was about to bring it up because we were talking about like, the tempo of this movie with the score, but it cuts dude, crazy. Whenever it's one of those sequences when it's just the band playing, I'm in awe. Even when it's just like one of the other practices, I'm just like, Jesus Christ, all the shit they're showing me. It just keeps it moving, keeps it that electric energy throughout it. It's, it's insane. It's pretty impressive too, because like to be able to continue to have like energy and like a pace and like one room and it's a pretty bland room on top of it to like mm. have that throughout most of it and be able to continue to make interesting angles and interesting mm. cuts is yeah, it's it's got to be i mean it's hard to do when you've got a bunch of different stuff to work with mm-hmm. you've got like one or two dimly lit sets you know it's pretty tough so yeah that was pretty pretty impressive and the camera work is just like like one of my favorite shots is when they're um it's when like the first rehearsal with the studio band like right before the whole there's no mm-hmm. fucking mars bar down there like right before that it's like there's a moment when they're fletcher like has his hand up and they're about to play and it's like the anticipation of waiting for like the the first beat of the song and the camera just like spins around and you see all the musicians and then you just see fletcher's hand and then he's like yeah, yeah. and then like they start playing it's just like the coolest like the way they set up that shot and how you just see like the anticipation of mm-hmm. like them waiting for like this one downbeat. It's just I, I love it so much. I mean, some of my favorite editing in the movie is not even is like just right before that when it's just the kids setting up. Because yeah. like, like I said, I'm a band kid. I did that every day, like five days a week for like seven years. Just those kids getting together, like the clicking and the clacking of the cases, everything like that. Like it was so familiar to me. And there's like so many shots of just like that that like brought me like home a little bit like i know this world like i'm in and it's one that means a lot not means a lot but like i get just like kind of whiplash from it but like when there's the shot after they've stopped playing um after they stopped playing caravan like that first time through and everything like that where a kid opens the little valve from his trombone and the spit comes out 
dude, never walk bare th- barefoot through a band room. There is spit all over the floor, all over, yeah. everywhere, every inch. Don't think like, man, I would always look back because the trombones were right behind the saxophones. I would look back. The floor was just soaked every single time. <laughs> Disgusting. But I was like, that's it. Like, it takes someone who was in band to know that that shit is there all the time. That's just like a fun detail for me. I yeah. fucking love that shot, that little cut between it and everything like that. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, hate that shot, man. I'm so it's like one of my. If you want to learn a little, little mm-hmm. fear of my, not fear, but like something that I just can't do in life, mm-hmm. seeing other people spit and seeing it on the ground makes me actually gag. I cannot fucking stand it. <laughs> so it, that <laughs> shot specifically ruined it. I'm so sorry. I'm glad it's so fucking great for you, Brandon. I love it, man. I'm, I'm sorry. glad it means so much to you. Man. It does. It like I hate that shot. I'm sorry. I think it's great. I love the like the cut from the guy like opening it to the spin. Like I think it's a well edited scene. I Editing's think it's great. great. The shot makes me want to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of shit in this movie. That makes me, we haven't talked about the blood in this movie. Great blood in this movie. Oh yeah, yeah. Great blood. Um, but. I wanted to get back to the music and the editing and the pace of the movie real quick. Because I wanted to, like, you think about another movie that came out, like, two years before it, which is, I don't, maybe it wasn't even two. Maybe it was, like, literally the year before. But you think about a movie like Birdman, which, not a movie I like a ton. Actually came out the same month that Whiplash did. Did it? That's great. Yeah, it was November 2014. Is that did Brendan get dumped? Like... Whoa, hold on. Oh, God. Well, hold on. I know this. What's the name of the movie? I got IMDb MDB pulled up, people. Because I know Bird, Birdman Bird won 2013. Man. What won 2014? Birdman. Here Birdman we go. won this picture, 2014. Birdman. Now that sounds right now. Now you're probably right. Nominated in the same year. There it is. There it is. November 14th, there 2014. The, on this live, people. I haven't seen this. Fletcher, right. you need to give this man an award right now. That's, That's the right. first stone okay. for Brendan Murphy. He that? was 100% I'm really quality. good with, like, dates and when movies See, came out and stuff like I that. I used to be. Yeah. I've gotten worse at it, obviously. I can't believe I just saw it happen. I never thought I'd see it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, sure. Maybe You're something like, like a son. Thing, like, okay. like, Brendan knows everything. Did I just, like break the space-time continuum or something? Not really. You're supposed to be the guy. All right, calm down. Let's, <laughs> let's calm down, okay? I'm not some... Been officially now. dethroned. Take the crown off his head. I mean, I guess I could go ahead and walk out. Fletch, a uh, new host. Yeah, good movies yeah. With Fletcher Matthew and Fletch. Uh, <laughs> got, uh, see you later. Uh, <laughs> all right, but... um, So, yeah. So, my initial point I was trying to make uh, before I got absolutely spit roasted right there. <laughs> hey, uh, you just terranged you, all right? That's fair. Okay, that's that. Yeah, that, that humbled me a little bit. Okay, I got it. That's fair. I need I need to go back and brush up on my movie release dates. That's all. That's all I'm here. God, I can't believe I missed that. Honestly, I'm like a little stunned. Oh well, that's fine. You should. It's okay. What 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 one 2014? 2014 was Birdman. Okay, all right, yeah. that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll take it and try it. <laughs> you shook, that, man. What, what were you trying you're, to do? Well, here's the thing. You're adding great right you're, now. You're, you're fucking Jimmy Conway at the fucking poker table. You're going to let this man say this to you? What is this world coming to? Like, son of a bitch. I didn't, help. I didn't help anything. I know I didn't. Yeah, that's fine. It's whatever. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> that is yeah, funny. Uh, but um, just, like, thinking about, like, Birdman... And how obviously that's a movie that like got a lot of praise for um, like the fact that there's this drum score going throughout it. And like, I feel like this movie didn't get any of that praise, which yeah. like, and everyone's like, oh, Birdman, there's like a guy playing drums in the movie. And I'm like, it gives a shit. <laughs> now that just might be because I'm a guy who like doesn't like Birdman, honestly, like a whole lot. Like I'm just yeah. kind of sour on it. I don't love it as well. It's like, I don't know. I was talking with a buddy about it. Recently, I'm just like, with all of Inuritu's movies, I feel like it's just like him showing off the whole time without a yep. whole lot of stuff. Like, especially you think about The Revenant and it's just like him, just like, look at how amazing of a director I am. You see how awesome I am? I'm the baddest motherfucker you've ever seen. I'm just like, okay, man, good for you. 
you made two movies that like have a lot of continuous shots you're the best sure great awesome uh <laughs> jesus <laughs> i don't know i mean look, here's the thing the guy makes a bunch of pretentious movies i'm gonna be pretentious a little bit back okay listen okay okay because me and Fletch, we're, we're both those superhero comic book boys where we love the superhero movies. We line up every day. And yeah, exactly. Yeah, I saw, yeah, I right there. And like you make a movie where like, there's no real art anymore. <laughs> the superhero movies have killed the art. And I'm like, shut up, dude. Okay, fine, whatever. Get yeah. out of here. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you for a sec. You do know that Martin Scorsese said that like the Marvel films were like a yeah, but he's cinema. And I know Marty's your guy, so. Yeah. But also, Martin Scorsese is 70 years old. Do you think I expect <laughs> Martin Scorsese to be like, yeah, I can't wait for uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. That's my shit. That's fair. That's fair. I you think Martin Scorsese is different time. Listen, but also, Martin Scorsese isn't, like, making a movie about how, the, like, it's so terrible. Like, Okay, Scor- fair. That's fair. I will like, say I love, um, I talk about Inuritu, I love The Revenant. I think that's, like, a wonderful movie, but... Birdman just didn't quite like connect with me as much. Yeah. I think just like Revenant, I think it's impressive. It's just like it's not a movie I want to go back to a lot. Yeah. I'd go back like, to it for Leo's performance. I like watching Leo. Yeah, that makes see, sense. But, you can't ever go wrong with Leo. See, but like for me, that's a I might get some heat for this, but that's a departed situation where it's like, listen, it's great. It's Leonardo DiCaprio. It's great. It's awesome. Is it his best work? I, I think he tortured himself into an Oscar, yeah. is what happened. He did, because he did a lot of that shit. Like, they did that out yeah. in the actual way. Yeah, he definitely went through a lot of pain for that film. And I'm down. Like, if that's what it takes to do it, fine. I get it. I understand. But, like, I don't know. I wouldn't make put that as a top five Leo performance, if you ask me. Probably not. Um, but that's just me. And I think, obviously, some of the set pieces are cool. But a lot of it is just like, look at how moody this is. You see how we did this in natural lighting? Isn't that cool how we did it in natural lighting? Yeah, it's pretty cool how we did it in natural lighting. It's just a lot of that for me, which I understand, but I feel like it detracts from the movie a lot for me personally. Like, I get it. There's a point where you, you want to, like, make it feel like, and it does at certain points where it's just like, this movie, the movie feels cold. Like, you watch that movie, like, middle of July, like, 115 degrees, you're going to, like, put reach for a jacket no matter what because the movie just feels cold. But there's also a point where I'm just like, you could cut 30 minutes of this movie. You could cut 30 minutes of this movie, and I don't want why you're making it like this. But sure. Yeah, it's definitely strong. They weird. definitely drag out the point of, like, he's alone, he's starving, he's cold. It's like, yeah, I know. We got it. It's just like, it's like, it's a lot of movie in all the wrong ways for me personally. Okay. Like, you compare it to something like, something, a movie of the same length, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like, infinitely better movie in my opinion. And it has all those flourishes. It gets you in a place and a time, but it's not all about that. And it's not all about like, look at our performances. Look at the movie I'm making. Like it's about, you know, the story that he's telling. And I, I feel like with Inuritu, that that's kind of what it is for me personally. Okay. That's my problem with him. I mean, the man can shoot a movie. I'll say that right now. Like the man's movies looks great. Just not for me. That's, that's just me personally. But so that's our little Birdman tangent and our little Indian Ritu tangent. That's, so that's fun. I mean, same year. They were in competition together. Like, why not? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this movie has such an incredible pace. The editing is fantastic. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit, but, like, the caravan sequence is fantastic. It's a marvel of sound, editing, performance. Like, exactly what you want out of cinema, honestly. Like, that's why I'm so invigorated after watching this movie every single time because those last 10 minutes are just – I don't know. Like, it's a strange comparison to make, but, like, it's fu- like fucking Mad Max Fury Rat Road, like, at that moment, where it's just, like, yeah. pulling out all the stops. Like, it's it's insane. I love it so much. I'm all in on it. You know what I like is this is the second time now this has happened. Mm-hmm. After, like, the podcast, after we talked about it, I like the movie more. I'm going to definitely, I'm going to go back and watch it again now and have more appreciation, because I did not like it that much going through it the first time. But now that we broke down some of like the way these characters' motivations are, and it's like, oh shit, I guess yeah, that is kind of what was happening. Specifically, even like the girl thing that I didn't like. Yeah. But, you know, this is why this is why we do this, man. Because I get excited when all of a sudden my I know if my perspective can get changed on a film because I'm just hearing straight up facts. I'm like, you know, man, that's what I live for. I hope someone else can hear this and be like, 
Oh. That makes sense. That's crazy. That, I never thought about that. Dude, I'm That's telling like, you. And Fletcher can come back for this because he did it with me. He fucking flipped my ass. He ghosted me. But, like, when we finally do, because we've been talking about it, maybe next summer we, we do it. But we were talking about Summer of Star Wars and, like, the Last Jedi episode. I'm excited. I'm oh. excited. It's going to be good shit. I'm going to try. I'm going to try my best. I know I won't. I probably won't get far, but, like, <laughs> I'm going to try my best for that shit. Oh, is Fletcher not on board with The Last Jedi? No, me and him are. I know you're not. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, you're going to have a good okay, time yeah. with me because, oh, man. I, I'm a big Last Jedi fan. Well, uh, I, we ain't got time for that tangent right now. Uh, we don't have time for that. That's, like, a, long, long. that's a tease. I was we should talk about the, um, the big car wreck scene and then Andrew getting uh, expelled and then we go into the finale. That's probably For sure. For sure. sure. Absolutely. So, yes. Yeah, so we have the scene where it's um, – it's Tanner, it's Connery, not Connery, Connolly and Andrew fighting for the part. I love the fucking just like, yeah, we're going to be here for five hours just waiting for them to like get on time. And yeah. then they, I love his line after all of it. It's just like, now we can start. I love that shit. <laughs> yeah. um, and then they're just like out in the cold 2 a.m. Call time at 5 a.m. tomorrow. At, uh, not 5 a.m. 5 tomorrow, guys. Don't be late. Give yourself two hours. Better not fucking be late. Um, and then, yeah, we have this really fun, energetic sequence of Andrew just trying to get there. Um, yeah. Once again, a lot of fun cutting. A lot of fun just, like, I don't know. I feel like we've all had that day where we're just like, nothing can go right for us. Everything is just falling apart. We accidentally left our sticks at the fucking rental car place. <laughs> Um, and dude, it's some of, I think it's some of Miles, Miles Teller's best work in the movie, personally. Yeah. That really. scene, yeah, definitely. When he's like under all that pressure, mm -hmm. if once the tire goes flat, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, um, the, the scene where, you know, he gets in the wreck and like, he like crawls out of the car and there's like blood on him and stuff. Mm -hmm. I've always found like, I mean, I could suspend my, suspend reality for like a little mm -hmm. bit for that, but like it's like a bit much that he like you know survives a car wreck and then like goes and tries to play in this show like that's, that's I, always like the most unbelievable part of the movie for me yeah but i'm able to look past it because the rest of the filmmaking is just like so damn great you're right though because i noted that too i said it out loud as soon as it happened especially because he got hit on like the driver's side and that was like yeah. a big ass like 18 i was yeah. like nobody's getting up from that he's you're not walking away from that. Not like that quick. You're not going to get up and go drum. Like, again, like you said, the rest of it works. So it's not like it ruins the movie. But yeah, I definitely noted that too. I was like, eh, that's not, that wasn't exactly believable. I, sure. do lo I do love the scene. Like, I do love the implication. Like, like I I'm still shocked every time by the car crash. And I remember I the first the time shot. just like. I love the shot how it flips with the car and you just stay in it. I yeah, yeah. That. that is cool. I mean, the best part of that, I mean, it's a Blumhouse movie, too. The fucking jump I had when I first saw it where the shot of the phone pan up to Andrew and just truck oh. coming right out you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gets you every time. Yeah, it's a good so one. Good. The first time, he's, that's definitely good. And I don't know. I do love, like, the shot of him just, like, limping, fucking busting ass to the concert hall. And the looks that everyone is giving him, just like, this motherfucker is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and even Fletcher's just like, what is this guy doing? Yeah. He's finally shocked. Like, that's the first time you see on his face, like, uh, what the hell? Right. <laughs> this kid, okay, fine. I'm not going to go easy on you, but like, Jesus, okay. Mm. We're, we're cooking now. And then he fucking, he fails. I love the whole fucking. We were talking about it earlier, but the showdown between Andrew and Fletcher, when he's like, no, that's my part. Yeah. You can't give it away. Uh, great sequence. And the whole tirade, Fletcher goes on, and he's like, if you mess up once, I will fucking drum you out of this institution. You'll be flipping pages until you graduate, which we have not talked about this. One of my top five favorite lines of the movie, flip my pages, bitch. <laughs> yeah 
Good shit yeah. right there. He yells at Connolly. Yeah. I flip my pages, bitch. Johnny Utah. Like, <laughs> oh, he's finally, like, becoming Fletcher. Just that yeah. symbiote. I was like, he's spending so much time with him. He looks up to him so much. He's becoming Fletcher. I fucking love that shit. Um, and then, yeah, we have the whole, like, section where his dad is trying to convince him, you got to sue this guy. You got to gotta testify in Wait, court. Before we get to that, um, there's the scene where, you know, he screws up and then yeah. Fletcher, like, stops them. And he's like, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize on behalf of Schaefer Conservatory. Then this man comes out and decks him. And J.K. Simmons actually broke a few ribs during that scene. I don't know if you knew that. Really? Yeah, it was totally real. Damn. Miles wow. Teller. Maybe drafted by the NFL, he can fucking break J.K. Simmons' ribs. Just one tackle. <laughs> hey, man, it's Division Three. It is Division Three. <laughs> Division Three. Get the man it. was 60 years old at the time. Maybe exactly. we can. Let's not act like he's taken down a primed <laughs> running back like Derrick Henry or something. Maybe. Maybe he does take them up with the offer. Why don't you come play di- play with us? I, th- I think. He- <laughs> yeah, he should take it up the offer. He had great. He form. could stick him. He uh-huh. could stick him for sure. Fresh like Jenkins. Safety or something coming over the top. Why yeah, why not? He's got some legs. I mean, he was like from the drums to Fletcher in like two seconds. Yeah, it was quick. Yeah, okay. he said, I wonder what his 40 is. It's probably. I'd love to know what his 40 is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, and yeah, then we go into that whole sequence. And, you know, it's. I do like the fact that Andrew is just like, why would you do this to me? Like, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I don't want to go through with yeah, this. For sure. Because I feel like even though Andrew is going through hell right now, having a rough time, mentally he's all over the place. He's still the best he's ever been as far as, like, drumming and everything like that. Like, this is what he wanted. He's there. He's on the track. And, yeah, I I don't know. It's just to still – to go through all of this and to see his father like, no, this guy's crazy. What are you doing? And Andrew's still like – no, that's my buddy over there. I don't want to, like, rat him out. Right. Yeah. Just, like, how much Fletcher has, like, dug into him. Yeah. And you know what's so devastating about this is, like, uh, in that scene, like, it, it's intermingled with all those cuts of um, Andrew, like, getting rid of his drum stuff and, like, taking the posters off the wall and stuff. And <laughs> the scene always reminds me of, you know, in Spider-Man 2 when Peter, like, yeah. he, like, gives up and he, like, throws his – suit in the trash can and stuff like just you're watching someone take something they love so much and they're so passionate about just throw it away like it's so just it's just so devastating oh wait wait spider-man 2 what what is this movie you're talking about spider-man 2 i have not heard of this (laughs) i don't talk about it literally every time we get on to record or some shit (laughs) never it's your least (laughs) favorite movie i'm pretty sure yeah out of the spider-man's least favorite i think out of the twos, I think I got to go to Amazing Spider-Man 2 over Spider-Man 2. Like, that's just me personally. <laughs> uh, bravura performance by Jamie Foxx as Electro. Uh, <laughs> hope to see him in the yeah. potential crossover uh, that's coming with whatever Spider-Man 3 is going to be. Very excited um, about that. Oh, for sure. You know, 100%. I know we hit on it last week or two weeks ago, but very excited about that. Right? 100%. <laughs> but, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it's exactly that. And, I mean, I don't know. I'd love to see J.K. Simmons just, like, tape uh neiman's drum set to his wall we needed it when we needed him most i also have to point out how incredible that jk well i guess jk simmons has nothing to do with him quitting being spider-man but i was just gonna say the fact that jk simmons is in the other movie that you just mentioned well that's what i'm talking about is that jk simmons literally forces him to hang up his shit every time yeah (laughs) i mean i'd love if just literally the next scene you see him he's like put on the wig He's got the mustache. He protected us. <laughs> he did what no one else could. I miss him. <laughs> That's literally what happens in this movie. Holy shit. Yeah. Like, we need him back. He gets back on the drums. He's a menace. A thief. <laughs> we got to get him off the drum set again. What are we talking about? Oh, it's incredible. Right? Good mm-hmm. shit. J.K. Simmons, good actor in a lot of good movies like to see it um and then yeah we talk i think we we did we did our little talk about the scene in the jazz club i think we covered everything yeah, there great scene one of the best in the movie 100 um and then yeah we get to 
Carnegie Hall. And man, the lead up to what is ha- what's about to happen, pretty great. Once again, J.K. Simmons is like finessing him a little bit, getting his hopes up, getting that confidence up. Like, okay, we're ready. I need you. He's like fucking Lucy with the football. And Andrew's Charlie Brown, like, you know, my drummer's not working out for me, man. Uh, and, you know, like, I, I saw this in you, like, you know, Connolly, he was just motivation for you, man. What are you talking about? Tanner? Yeah, I knew he didn't have him. He's like pre-med now. Like, it was you all along, man. You are my guy. Buttering him up so that I'll say yes. And so you can bring him out on stage and just fucking demolish him. He said, you yeah. think I'm an idiot? Yeah, I think I'm a fucking yeah, idiot. I think I'm fucking stupid. He's yeah. like, what? I know it was you. And then he just turns around and goes to start the show, and you're just like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and intentionally sabotages him with a different song. Incredible. I, I mean, he literally says before they walk out, these cats don't forget, this is your career right here. If yeah. you have one good night here, you're yeah. set for life. God. And he, he's so sinister. Oh, God. And I love that look on Neiman's face when he first walks over. He's like looking up. He's so happy. He's so ready. Uh, you think I'm fucking stupid. And it just drops. He realizes uh, what's really going on. And then he says, up swinging. And then <laughs> the look on Miles Teller's face as he looks around as everyone is flipping their pages. And he's just like, oh, no. I got played again. Mm-hmm. And the first time I saw it, the fucking – my stomach dropped, man. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't feel. I was there was a. I couldn't feel. I I was devastated. Yeah. I was. I mean, it, it shakes you. It really does that first time you see it. And he tries to play along. I fucking love how much of a train wreck it is. He does like. <laughs> one of my favorite little details, and it's something they couldn't didn't have to do. Maybe didn't think to do, but. When he's supposed to have a solo, there's all the lights going off around him specifically, and everyone's yeah. eyes are on him, and no one else is playing. I love that shit. And he goes on after the song ends. It's perfect. It's so good. Yeah. And that walk off to his father um, mm-hmm. is so great. And then the ma- then he walks back out. Yeah. And you're like, oh, shit. And <laughs> I forget, does he do the little thumbs up to him, like, right like right before? I feel like he does, like, Fletcher, just, like, a little, I'm ready. Before he goes, just to be, like, a little, like, a little fuck you. Just, like, I'm not leaving. I'm planted starts, on this. I think he just starts playing. Yeah, I don't think he gives him a thumbs up. Yeah, I okay, think he fair. just starts playing. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking of when he, like, gets back from the car crash, when he's like, yeah, I'm yeah. ready to go, don't you worry. Okay, yeah, yeah that's my bad. Exactly. Yeah. He, well, Fletcher starts talking, and then he cuts him off and starts playing starts Caravan. Starts playing Caravan. <laughs> Which is awesome. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> J.K. Simmons is like, I want to murder this little fuck. Yeah. Little, you see it all in his face. You see every range of just, like, I want to kill him. Yeah. So much. And the way the rest of the band just kind of comes in, and then you have just, like, one of the better finales of the last decade yeah, in a movie. Is, without a doubt. Some of the I love most the confidence he has there with, uh, like, say, I'll cue you. I'll cue you. He says it to uh, yeah. uh, Terrence Which, to all, I'll cue you. I always, I always love when movies do that, especially now in the post-Walk Hard era. <laughs> Follow my lead. It's just like, what yeah. the fuck are you talking about, man? Shout <laughs> out Joaquin. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and then, yeah, I mean... We talked about it earlier, but, like, this piece of music, it, mm-hmm. it fucking, it slaps. It fucking it rules. It's a <laughs> it bop and a half, man. <laughs> it fucking, like, the range it goes through, like, it, it's just, every time I listen to it, I'm just, like, all in on it. Like, yeah. and every time I watch it, like, I still have that just electric feeling mm-hmm. that I had back in 2014 when I first watched it. Um, yeah. Which I feel like is very hard for a movie to keep hold of, like, Whenever, like, a movie, like, whenever you see a movie for the first time and you walk out and you've had a great time, you thought the ending was incredible, like, there's always that, like, second or third watch where, like, this is still great, but, like, it just doesn't have the same effect. And, like, so few movies have that effect where they create that effect every single time you watch it. And I feel like 
And Matthew, I get it. Like, obviously, you did not see this movie when it first came out, and there's all this hype surrounding it. And I just pretty much gave it to you blind, like, yeah, Whiplash. You haven't seen a trailer. You didn't even know what it was about. And you're six years on. And, like, even when I was watching it last night, I was like, there are a couple moments where I'm like, this is a little slow. Um, you know, not all of this is working as well for me this time around. But, like, once that – once those last ten minutes hit, like, all that bullshit fades away. This is a five-star movie, no question. Yeah. Um, One of those emotional finales ever, ever made. 100%. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the way Fletcher turns, like the emotional journey that Fletcher goes through in these 10 minutes yeah. is incredible. Yeah. Um, and I think people talk about like the moment you win like your Oscar in a movie and it's the one they play. And I feel like for J.K. Simmons, it's the first scene where he fucking chews out Neiman and it's the last father fucking time and all that bullshit. And are you rushing? Are you dragging? But there's a strong case that this is number two. Yeah. And I feel like it might be the strongest acting in, he gives in the movie, which is saying a lot considering the whole performance is like 10 out of 10 knockout, full on one of the better performances I've seen ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, I love the, like, just the evolution of you see him just fucking pissed off at Neiman. Every time he, like, what he's conducting, he's just looking over and just giving the, sh- the head shake. Every single time he's like, oh, this kid. Oh, he got me. Oh, I'm so frustrated. And then just like, he's starting to like, all right, that's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, I'm feeling it a little bit. Okay. Looks over Neiman, gives him like a little look. The fucking dude, every time he fucking hits that symbol and it almost takes his fucking head off. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's oh. the and he's like, what does he say to him? I'll he, fucking gouge your eyes out. That's it, yeah. And he hits the symbol in his face. I like, I die laughing every single time. Every time. It's so good. It's so funny. And then you finally just see him like, this man has the biggest smile on his face. Yeah. He's just like enjoying it. He's fucking like, God damn it. I love Jet. Like he's, you finally see that like wall break down. And I feel like it's the first time you like see him just like kind of lose himself for a little bit. Like he's not thinking about this long game he has to play he's not thinking about like what he has to do or anything like he's finally just like finally like can be himself for like a second yeah just being joyful and you like yeah. never see him do that the entire i feel moment. like you do get a glimpse of it when you see him at the bar when he's playing you see that oh, yeah. true a bit true. Of like a, no, that right. love he used to have and then this right here is like showing his love again but like because he sees someone else like achieving that level that maybe he himself never got to so he's like here it is like, like you yeah. know He's, he's getting his Charlie Parker. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. And then, dude, and then there's the part where Andrew just goes off the fucking reservation, mm-hmm. which, which the song up to this point and the whole sequence up to this point has been incredible. But, like, once again, there's that, like, little shift where, like, something is happening. Mm-hmm. And then even Fletcher comes over and he's like, what the hell are you doing, man? Like, he's scared. Like, he's finally, like, caught off guard. Like, what the fuck is happening? And there's so many, like, good moments with Fletcher in those last little moments. Like, we were talking about last night, but, like, when he adjusts the symbol after it falls for a second. Yeah. So good. Shows how committed he is, what he cares about. He's like, look, I see it. It's happening. Yeah. 100%. And when he does the little, like... like, Yeah, he starts like, like, oh, yeah. It's like he finally found his tempo, and he's like, "There it is. That's my tempo." And I love, I love how he takes his jacket off, <laughs> like he puts it down, like he's just like, so into it. And then yeah. he like raises the band, and like he's like doing that the whole time. Uh-huh. So great. And dude, and then the like, so you kind of get to the end to, of it, silent for like three, four seconds, and there's just that look, the yeah. whole movie right there, and it's like they both know. There's that um, connection. It's like, and, and that's all that like Fletcher needs to do is just like, you fucking did it, man. Congratulations. Uh, you win the chocolate factory, lifetime supply of chocolate. Uh, he had to do the whole like, you get nothing, you lose good day, sir. But like, you fucking did it, pal. You did, like, <laughs> it's great. It's so joyful and triumphant. And then they have that, he has that last little fucking second of him playing the drums and he's yeah. fucking going crazy. And it's it's incredible. It's you fantastic. Know, the, um, 
I heard a really interesting interpretation of the like the final shot of the movie. Mm-hmm. And so you know how Fletcher's standing there and he like gestures to Andrew, like he puts his hand out like that. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like someone said it looks like um, almost like it's like a mad scientist saying like it's alive, like look at my creation, awesome. kind of like Frankenstein. It's like he's putting his hands out and like look at the monster I've created, kind of like gesturing. That's awesome. Andrew. Yeah, I just think that's a really interesting way to look at it. Like that's he's like, yeah. holy shit, I. I may, I got my next Charlie Parker. Like it's I, alive. It, it's alive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, and like the gesture that he makes, that's what goes along with it. I just, I think that's so cool to think about it like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's funny because, like I said, I was doing the future before, but like he literally told Simmons, like, I don't want you to be a person. I want you to be a monster. I want you to be an animal. Like I want you to be yeah. a goal. Like he, like the whole time he's told this man, like, bring the fucking heat. And yeah, like. And now that he sees that, like, finally Andrew has also become that, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a good movie. Like, just, end of the day, like, what a good fucking movie. Um, Oh, we almost forgot. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite camera techniques in Mm -hmm. any movie ever is in this final scene uh, that what what I think is called a wit pan, from what I know, Mm -hmm. when... The camera goes from Fletcher in the background, like beating along with the song, and it cuts over to Andrew playing the drums and yeah. it just goes back and forth. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a movie. I just that's great. That's such a great technique. Not true. And I mean, I'll catch myself in the car when I'm listening to it, doing the whole thing. I'll do the like it's fucking. He's got yeah. the finger guns going. <laughs> Me too. I, I, I love that shit. Yeah, it's so good. Um, but yeah, so I mean, so this movie. It comes out. Well, first to play Suns Dance and wins the jury award. We talked about that. And then Sony picks it up and drops around like October, November. And then it has just this rise, man. And we get J.K. Simmons' statue. Um, movie gets nominated for five Oscars. Best Picture, Best Screenplay, Best Supporting Actor. Um, I think Best Sound Mixing, Best Film Editing. Wins three of those. It wins Sound Mixing, Editing, and supporting actor and like what can you say like it deserves all three of those oh yeah we specifically talked about like it's one of the better edited like i mean talk about sound like honestly every technical aspect is just absolutely perfect yeah um so yeah i mean is there anything else you guys want to talk about anything else we should hit before we wrap up um I think we've covered pretty clearly. I know you definitely wanted to, uh, you had a little yes, trivia question, right? Yes, sir. That's right. So thank you for watching our episode on Whiplash. And we got a little surprise for you if you made it to the end. Um, so to do this episode of Whiplash, so I've been eyeing that new 4K that just came out for a little bit. And then I figured out we were doing this and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go get that. It's on sale right now. All the Black Friday stuff is starting to happen. And I already own this movie on Blu-ray, so I got myself a new Whiplash uh, digital code. So right now we got a little trivia question for you. And what we're gonna do? So to get this Whiplash trivia, this sorry, to get this Whiplash digital code, what you're gonna do is you're gonna follow us on Instagram. We're gonna put up a post there. You're gonna like the post, and you're gonna comment below what the answer to this trivia question is. And Here's the trivia question. So we talked about how this was a short film first before it was, you know, before it was financed and became a full feature length film. But Miles Teller was not the lead in that short film. And my question to all you fine people out there who watched to the end, thank you so much for doing that. We really do appreciate it. Um, Who was the original Andrew Neiman in the 2013 short film Whiplash? So like I said, go to our Instagram, we'll have a post up. Like it, comment below what the answer is. And uh, by the end of um, a week after this episode drops, um, I'll pick a winner and you'll get your, uh, your digital copy of Whiplash. So be looking out for that. I'm um, looking for the people, Brendan. I see you. That's right. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I mean, I give the movies to the people. That's what, that's what I'm best at. I mean, I mean, I remember when I finally gave you the keys to my digital collection of movies, you, you, were, you had a field day. 
I'm pretty grateful. Yeah, I don't. It, it, I don't tell anybody about it. I'm just like, look, I know what I got going on around here. That's right. You struck gold. Yeah I, yeah, I don't. I don't show my friends. It's not one to brag about. It's a. It's you know you know when you got a good card, you're like, all right, I'm gonna just keep this tucked away. So yeah. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Well, if there isn't anything else, um, well, Fletch, thank you so much for being on. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, also, I want to make. Uh, a bit of a shameless plug if Dude, please right. um, literally I, was about to ask <laughs> like <laughs> cool. um i do have a youtube channel uh, over there I, I review movies tv shows um planning on doing some video game coverage in the coming weeks so if you want to check that out um i'm sure brendan could put a uh, link in the description if for sure possible. we'll definitely be down there we'll make sure we put all your instagram all your twitter all that good stuff in the description as well um but yeah so Thanks again for watching, everybody. Please like, subscribe, comment down on our post. We'd love to hear what you think of Whiplash. Did you see it when it first came out? Were you as awestruck by me and Fletch when you saw it? Um, do you still have some reservations a little bit, like Madna? Like, well, let's talk about that down in the comments. We, I, I love talking about this movie. I, we, we, we've gone very long on this, and I'm very happy about it because I love talking about this movie. But I could still talk about it, like, another hour more because I – and me and Fletch are the people to do it because, I mean – Oh yeah. I think our love for this movie is pretty apparent um, where it stands for us. Um, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, all that. We'll have all those links down in the description below and we'll see you guys next week. All right, people.